Section 9, Fire Prevention and Protection. The references for this section are EM 385, TAC 1, TAC 1, Section 9, 29 CFR 1910.155, Subpart L, 29 CFR 1926.150, Subpart F, and the Uniform Facilities Guide Specification 0135.26. Fires and explosions on contractor work sites have the potential to lead to property damage. For example, thermal, smoke, and fumes, extinguishing agent damage, including water, and additional items. Injury from smoke inhalation or thermal burns, and even potentially death. The following have been reported to be direct causes of fire-related mishaps or the severity of subsequent damage on contractor work sites. Lack of ignition source control, improper storage, use of compressed gas, Defective and improper use of temporary heating devices, improper storage, use, or disposal of flammable and combustible materials, scraps, etc., smoking near flammables and combustibles, inadequate types, numbers, and locations of fire extinguishers. The following have been reported to be indirect causes of fire related mishaps or the severity of the subsequent damage on contractor work sites. Lack of training, supervision or implementation of AHAs or SOPs, failure to apply AHA by site supervision or workers, inadequate site-specific safety training prior to the phase of work, failure to implement accepted fire protection plan, failure to regularly perform site safety inspections, and fire extinguishers not provided or working properly. Every year, fires take thousands of lives and cost billions of dollars. The first line of defense is a fire prevention plan. A fire prevention plan shall be written for facilities and project sites. For construction operations, see the National Fire Protection Association 241 standard for safeguarding construction, alteration, and demolition operations. For marine operations, see section 19 floating plant and marine activities. Section 19.A.04 discusses emergency planning. The fire prevention plan shall include as a minimum a list of the major workplace fire hazards, potential ignition sources, the types of fire suppression equipment or systems appropriate to control the fire, assignments of responsibilities for maintaining the equipment and systems, personnel responsible for controlling the fuel source hazards, housekeeping procedures, including the removal of waste materials. The government designated authority shall survey all activities and determine which require a hot work permit. All hot work and hot work permits shall conform to local policy when present. Hot work permits shall be required when performing activities which generate or have the potential to generate heat sparks, or open flames, such as abrasive blasting, burning, brazing, cutting, grinding, powder actuated tools, hot riveting, soldering, thawing activities, welding, or any similar operation capable of initiating fires or explosions. Hot work operations include the following associated requirements. Areas shall be surveyed prior to performing any hot work to ensure they are free of fire hazards and to determine if a fire watch is required. Fire watches shall be conducted in accordance with section 09.K.01 and 09.K.03. A fully charged fire extinguisher, minimum 10 pounds, shall be readily available in the immediate area of the hot work. Hot work operations also include the following associated requirements. Hot work permits shall include dates authorized for hot work and identify the objects on which the hot work is to be performed. The permit shall be kept on file until the completion of the hot work. Hot work is prohibited in the following areas. In areas not authorized by the GDA, 
in sprinklered buildings while such protection is impaired, in the presence of explosive atmospheres, areas where an explosive atmosphere may develop or where there is an accumulation of combustible dust, in areas near the storage of large quantities of exposed, readily ignitable materials such as bulk sulfur, baled paper, or cotton. All sources of ignition shall be prohibited within 50 feet of operations with a potential fire hazard. Areas where a potential fire hazard exists shall be conspicuously and legibly posted. No smoking, matches, or open flames. Smoking shall be prohibited in areas where flammable, combustible, or oxidizing materials are stored. A good housekeeping program that provides for prompt removal and disposal of accumulations of combustible scrap and debris shall be implemented on the site. Self-closing containers shall be used to collect waste saturated with flammable liquids. Only non-combustible or UL labeled non-metallic containers may be used to dispose of waste and rubbish. Measures must be taken to control the growth of tall grass, brush, and weeds adjacent to the facilities. Maintain a break of three feet around the facilities. When outside help is relied upon for fire protection, a written agreement shall be made or a memorandum of record stating the terms of the arrangement and the details for fire protection services and shall be provided to the GDA. Fire cutoffs shall be retained in buildings undergoing alterations or demolition until operations require their removal. During the construction process, the construction of firewalls and exit stairways required for completed buildings shall have priority. Fire doors with automatic closing devices shall be hung on openings as soon as practical. At least one portable fire extinguisher rated 20 BC shall be provided on all tank trucks or other vehicles used for transporting and or dispensing flammable or combustible liquids. Each service or refueling area shall be provided with at least one fire extinguisher rated not less than 40 BC and located so that an extinguisher shall be within 100 feet of each pump, dispenser, underground fill pipe opening, and lubrication or service area. No flammable liquid with a flashpoint closed cup test below 100 degrees Fahrenheit shall be used for cleaning purposes or to start or rekindle fires. The design, construction, and use of storage cabinets, indoor storage areas, outdoor storage areas, hazardous materials storage lockers, and other occupancies shall be in accordance with NFPA 30 or for marine applications, 46 CFR 147 covers the use of cabinets and 46 CFR 92.05 TAC 10 specifies the design and construction. Safety cans and other portable containers for flammable liquids having a flash point at or below 73 degrees Fahrenheit shall be labeled and listed and painted red with a yellow band around the can and the name of the contents legibly indicated on the container. This is a typical safety can, shows a cutaway of a type 1 safety can. It has a leak-tight gasketed lid that controls vapors and guards against dangerous spillage. It is spring-loaded and it closes automatically after filling or pouring. It has a free-swinging rounded handle that pulls back to open the lid. It contains a positive pressure release cap, an internal flame arrester, a yellow belly band with warning and large content identification areas, and it is an approved container by either FM, UL, ULC listed, or TUV certified. Storage areas and tanks shall be surrounded by a curb, earthen dike, or other equivalent means of containment of at least six inches in height and higher as needed to contain the contents in the event of a leak. Other secondary containment methods that are approved by the EPA or U.S. Coast Guard can be used in lieu of curbs or dikes. For example, double-walled tanks. Every container and vaporizer shall be provided with one or more safety relief valves or devices. These valves and devices shall be arranged to afford free vent to the outside air 
and discharge at any point not less than five feet horizontally from any building opening that is below the discharge point. When stored inside, empty containers which have been in LP gas service shall be considered as full containers for the purpose of determining the maximum quantity of LP gas permitted. An exception is a total of five one-pound propane cylinders may be stored indoors as long as they are stored away from exits and stairways or in areas normally used for the safe exit of people. Containers stored inside shall not be located near exits, stairways, or in areas normally used for the safe exit of people. Portable fire extinguishers shall be provided where needed as specified in Table 9-4. Fire extinguishers shall be inspected monthly and maintained as specified in NFPA 10. Records shall be kept on a tag or label attached to the extinguisher, on an inspection checklist maintained on file, or by an electronic method that provides a permanent record. This is an example of a fire extinguisher distribution table. It indicates the maximum rating for the single fire extinguisher maximum coverage or floor area per unit of rating, maximum floor area for the extinguisher, and maximum travel distance to the extinguisher, and it is set by occupancy either low hazard, medium hazard, or high hazard. The following information shall be checked and verified when conducting fire extinguisher inspections. The type of extinguisher, the labeling, whether the pins are in place, and the charge status of the extinguisher. Fire extinguishers shall be in a fully charged and operable condition and shall be suitably placed, distinctly marked, and readily accessible. Fires are classified according to the types of objects being burned. A Class A fire is ordinary combustibles such as wood, paper, cloth, rubber, or certain types of plastics. A Class B fire is flammable or combustible gases or liquids such as gasoline, kerosene, paint, paint thinners, or propane. Class C fires are energized electrical equipment such as appliances, switches, or power tools. Class D fires are certain combustible metals such as magnesium, titanium, potassium, or sodium. Fire extinguishers must be selected based on the class of fire they are expected to protect. Fire detection and employee alarm systems shall be designed and installed in accordance with the requirements of the NFPA and Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA.